Good morning, church. Good morning. I'm so glad that you're here. Uh, it's, look, the vibe this morning is family, so here we are. Um, there's a huge gap. Uh, in the, come down. Come be closer to me. Please, come on. I've got a couple of volunteers that move down closer to be Paris. I'll just talk a little bit while you stare and figure out who's going to move down and go a little closer. Um, but I just want to say good morning. Super glad that you're here. Super glad uh, that we uh, gather on Sunday and just be with each other. Uh, come and praise the Lord. Come and gather as a church. It's really a, a blessing and unique opportunity. Um, if you don't know, my name is Vinia. Uh, I serve here as Director of Art and Prayer. Um, so, trying to explain that is really kind of difficult. Like, I get to organize things for prayer, so our quarterly renew night, I get to help, you know, email people to be there, um, and then do some of our prayer rhythms for uh, the whole church. So, Sunday mornings, we have a corporate prayer time, and then there's a response team that comes up. On Sunday, and I, I text them to be there. Um, and then art, we get to use creativity as a way to get to know the Lord. There's a, a small little art gallery outside. If you haven't seen it, there's art. That's great. Um, but yeah, I get the privilege of, of seeing how those things really inform our relationship with the Lord. All right, enough about me. Uh, let's move into the Word. This summer, we have been in a series in Hebrews, um, where basically we've spent the summer walking through the entire book for the most part, and this week we are on Hebrews chapter 8. Last week, Cameron did an awesome job of walking through Jesus as the high priest. Um, it's kind of funny, Hebrews is a very technical book, um, and in fact, I voted we didn't do it during the summer, but here we are. So he graciously basically went through all of Jewish history to talk about this mysterious figure called Melchizedek and how he's the greater high priest. Uh, well, how Jesus is a greater high priest than him, and all the technicality, but ultimately we get down to the fact that Jesus mediates a better covenant. And so that we, that's what we pick up in Hebrews chapter 8, is that we see that the high priest, who is Christ, gives us another covenant, so today we pick up on the covenant. I have one real big point for us for the whole um, morning, is that Jesus brings a new covenant that invites us into intimacy. That's our kind of main points where we're going. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your kindness and your grace. Thank you that you are enough for us, that you are our sufficiency, um, that you are our blood was sufficient to bring us near. This morning, just draw our hearts and minds into what you have to say. Spirit, speak to our hearts. Um, anything that you want us to remember, let it stay, let it marinate and meditate in our spirit. Anything that's not like you would always. Father, uh, let there be no distractions to, to keep us from what you might have for us. Um, hide, hide us behind the cross. Draw us closer to you and to each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Alright, so we're in Hebrews chapter 8, starting in verse 8. Um, here we go. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant. And I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. This is the word of the Lord. So covenant is not really a word we use today. It's kind of odd. It feels like one of those like old English words that just reappear and we're expected to know what they mean. Um, I think the most relatable word we have nowadays is actually the word contract. You know, Cameron brought that up last week. Contract maybe is a better way to understand what a covenant is. But I almost would say contract isn't really fair a word to explain what a covenant is. Because when we think of contract, we think of lawyers, something legal, something clerical, and uh, sterile language, devoid of personal feelings, uh, devoid of any type of relationship. Um, we would prefer it that way, right? But a covenant actually is dependent upon relationship. It was the most intimate relationships in the ancient world that would be bound together um, to have a covenant. Maybe 
Today, one of the only examples we have in our culture specifically is the covenant of marriage. Um, when each person is saying, I'm giving myself to you completely. That means emotionally, socially, financially, physically, like utterly. And to you, you alone, until we die. They give a yes to this type of covenant, and it's completely full of risk, completely full of risk, and yet completely intimate. That's the yes they're giving to. And this is how God decides to relate to his people uh, in an intimate agreement through covenant. God also uses covenants to weave the redemption story through history. God writes his plan for the world through three covenants, starting with Abraham, Moses, and David. He wants to write the story of redemption, how Jesus is going to come and redeem all things through these larger images we see as covenants. The first, Abraham's covenant. God promises in this covenant a nation or a people that will be a blessing to the whole world. In Moses' covenant, God gives the law, or Torah, a way to live amongst the nations with each other and before God in God's idea of what's good, and it follow those God would promises to bless them and give them right relationship with him as uh, their people, and if broken, they would be estranged, and curses were attached to those things. David's covenant, uh, God promises a Messiah, a messianic king that would rule forever. And so Jesus not only completes these three covenants, nation, law, and reign, but he establishes a new one and ministers in one that never needs to be altered. It's brought on through faith in Christ, through his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, and his return. But how specifically? Let's, let's get into the nitty-gritty of how Jesus is the completion of these covenants. Well, in 1 Peter 2, 9, it's that God creates a new people, a new nation. It says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That means believers, Christians, those who will participate in the renewal of the world, blessing it. That's who we are, the new people that is created in Christ. And then we become heirs to this kingdom. A kingdom that is beautiful and wonderful, but is full of God and goodness, but also riches. That's the most blessed you could ever be, an heir to God's kingdom. Okay, what about the law? Okay, the law, how does Jesus fulfill the law covenant? Well, Jesus' work on the cross doesn't just cover our sins like the law would prescribe. You know, the priest would go before and then they would spill the blood of an animal to cover the sin of the people. Jesus cleanses us from the inside out. Completely, because the blood of Christ, we are declared clean, declared righteous, declared washed. Okay, what about the rain covenant? What about this king? Well, Jesus is the Messiah. He is the promised king. He's a better king, a better judge, a more valiant, more holy ruler, and more in love with the Father than David could ever be. Isaiah 9, 6 says, And the government will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time forever. So when we say Jesus finished the work, completed the covenants, he completed it totally. He is our ultimate fulfillment of the covenant. Redemption comes through Christ. The whole story is about him. And we see that it's woven through the history in the covenant narratives. But the particulars of how Christ actually enacts the new covenant is for next week. So pray for that person. That's who I'll that. Uh, the core call was up next week, giving the word for the first time, so support him. Uh, again, I have moved in for Corinthians, but here we are. Um, but it's here in Hebrews 8 that we see Jesus establish the new covenant. The beginning of Hebrews starts with that. We kind of read through the middle of it, but the beginning talks about a new covenant. Remember that a covenant is a doorway to a bound, intimate relationship. Jesus changes the rules of how we get to relate to God. And as a result, he invites us into a deep knowing. But before we talk about a God that we can know, let's talk about some people that we do not. 
celebrities. Okay, just gonna take a second, we're talking about some celebrities, all right? Before the 1990s, or how some Gen Z people like to make us feel old, the 1900s, um, <laughs> there are two major sources of celebrity news. One that is televised and one that's in print. Entertainment Tonight on the television, and People Magazine in print. After 2000, the millennia, uh, we saw an increase of print and televised celebrity news. Uh, bring that on through the increased use of the internet, we, don't, we then see a, you know, an onslaught of blogs. Everybody has their own celebrity blog. People got famous and rich on the Friday celebrity blogs. Um, and then they would use the internet as a source of news. Problematic, but okay. Move on through history to add social media. Everybody's got, you know, somebody, there's someone that wakes up and runs a fan account of someone they don't know, which blows my mind. They literally, if you want Instagram, there are fan accounts of celebrities that people just gather facts about strangers and post them every day so that other strangers can pretend to know that same stranger. It is odd. Anyway, but their lives were portrayed before us. They seem so close, like we actually can get to know them. But we don't know these people. We, y'all, we don't know these people. We do not know them. They are strangers. Um, way back in 2008, uh, Will Smith came to my high school. I went to a performing arts high school in Charlotte, and I think he was promoting the movie Seven Pounds. Like, oh, yeah, wow, yeah, I think, oh, wow, yeah, Seven Pounds. <laughs> way back in the day, and like the auditorium was in a, they canceled the class, like, they were like, class is messed up, Will Smith is here. <laughs> the auditorium was like in a frenzy, and like the teachers were freaking out because like, 2008, I think it was our teachers who were in their 30s and 40s were like, kids when he was on The Fresh Prince. So they grew up watching him. So like, you got the teachers geeking out, you got the students freaking out, and here he comes in, you know, promoting this movie with a huge smile on his face. Like, I remember, yeah, like, a, this is that like, guidance and earrings were like an acceptable male choice of jewelry, and like, the light hit it, and it was like gleaming, we're like, oh my gosh, this man is rich. <laughs> losing our minds and like you can tell me nothing for the end like the rest of the day like we were just like I met Will Smith I met the Fresh Prince like I acted like I knew this man and the reality is I did not know this man I did not know I never actually met him he talked to some uh, high school and middle schoolers about their artistic dreams to work at Starbucks one day and uh, be encouraged about it so I didn't know him side so note um this is this is not this is not, that's not the picture. I did my very best to find the newspaper clipping that our school made that day uh, about what's been coming. So I just found a picture of some other inner city kids. I thought y'all wouldn't be able to tell the difference. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, at least I am ashamed because that is definitely like an iPhone. I said 2008, that is strong track phone time. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's a, anyway. Uh, we can pretend to know people, but there's definitely a difference between knowing about someone and actually knowing someone. Like, you can follow a celebrity page or a sports star, whoever you might look up to in the public sphere. You can know all the info about them, uh, you know, their birthday, their favorite snacks, you know, when they were born. You can even, like, know their pre-performance rituals and adopt them. You know, like, I'm gonna do so-and-so skincare routine. Like, I'm gonna do so-and-so's uh, pre, I don't know, pre-track routine or something like that. You can try to adopt it and live into it, but you can't actually know them. You just know information about them. So if there's a difference between knowing about somebody and knowing somebody, then what is God actually inviting us into when he says that he can be known? Picking up in verse 10, or in Hebrews 8, 10 through 12, it says, This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor to say to one another, Know the Lord, because they all will know me from the least of them to the greatest, for I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. So in Christ, we can actually know the Lord. And that's different than the experience of the children of Israel because they had to rely on prophets 
priests, and kings to tell them about God. Kings represented God to the people. They sat on thrones, they dictated rulership. Prophets would hear from God and then have to tell the people what God said. Particular people heard from God. Priests had to go before God representing the people um, to God and administer mediating the covenant that they had, doing the worship, doing the works in the temple. But the people didn't have access to God like we do. They couldn't even approach the mountain where the law was given or the holies of holies in the temple because it had a veil that only the high priest could go into once a year. And like, he, he better be clean. Like He can't get caught slipping. Like He can't be in sin so much so that they learned to tie a rope around the high priest with a bell on it so they could hear the bell when he went into the holies of holies on the day of atonement to minister. And if the bell stopped, it meant he was dead. <laughs> and they would drag him out because they couldn't go in, drag him out by a rope. There was a clear separation between what was holy and what was not, what was God and what was the people. And Israel just knew about him. They didn't actually know him themselves. But in Christ, we get to know God because he came to us. Like We get to know someone because that someone came to us. Jesus comes as a person. The person of Jesus comes to us and does a simple thing. He reveals the Father to us. John 1, 18 says, No one has ever seen God, the only one and well, the one and only Son who is himself God and is at the Father's side. He has revealed him. And what is God doing through the Son while he's here? Why, why, is, why is the Son revealing the Father? Because the Father is drawing people to himself. John 6, 4, 4, uh, 44 says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And what's kind of interesting in this interplay is that the Hebrew author picks up on the same context for the word drawing that is used in the John passages when Jesus is speaking about the Father, and when he says the Father draws. And it's the same drawing that God uses when he's speaking to the people through Jeremiah. Okay, Jeremiah. It's a little weird. Mark out my Jeremiah video. We're in Hebrews. Well, the passage we're reading in Hebrews is a direct quote from Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31. And Jeremiah 31 is written at a time when Israel is facing judgment. They are facing the judgment of their, their sin, the consequences of their sin, for breaking the covenant before God, that second covenant made in Moses' time. And it caused great injustice in the land. Basically, they not just ignored God, like, this is a total side thing. I think sometimes when we... We come to the Lord, and we're learning new things about him, and we have all these questions about why he set up things the way he set them up. We don't always assume that God has good intentions in mind. Sometimes the rules just feel like rules. You know, we're just like, oh, God wants us to do this thing. We told the children of Israel to do this thing. But we don't assume that there's wisdom in them, that God wants good intention out of the boundaries that he's setting up. He set up a civil boundary for the people that would protect the widow, the orphan. He set up a civil boundary that would make sure they had food and could be heard before authority. God's law set up a place for those who were the lowest had access to the highest. God did not push people away. What did people do? People push those who were on the margins more to the margins. The strong, the powerful would win. But God's system honored those at the bottom because that's who he came for. So when the people threw away the law, they, didn't, they weren't just like, oh, we're going to do whatever we want. It had repercussions. There were people who fell out of sight in society that were no longer cared for, that God cared for, that God came for. So then rampant injustice is happening for years, and the people who were in charge to tell the people about God, the priests, the prophets, and the kings all turned their back. For years, and God sent prophet after prophet after prophet. He's like, hey, cut it out. Stop. I'm trying to tell you. You don't want to, you want to smoke. I'm trying to tell you. But also, he's hearing the cry of the widows. He's hear, they're crying out. People are losing their lives. There is, there are all types of immoralities happening with people, like all types of injustice. God hears the, the smallest cry and tries to tell the people, go back to what I established because God has actual goodness in mind. I just think we don't really lean into God's wisdom sometimes. We just try to treat it like, I do some good stuff, I don't get smitten, and we're good. We kind of miss the point that God loves us and wants good for us. It sets up 
uh, what he calls and declares in his law, or what Christ says in his word, for goodness for us. Anyway, that's a whole tangent, but yeah. So they're in a time where they, they were not listening, they were doing whatever they wanted to do, and now they're getting the consequences of their sin, and Syrians are coming, yada, yada, yada. Read about it, Jeremiah, Old Testament, super fun. Um, yeah. So he puts here, anyway, in the middle of their correction that God starts to promise them. Like, in the middle of their correction, they are receiving judgment for their disobedience, and yet God, in the middle of it, starts promising them redemption. He's like, this won't be the end for you. I have something, I have something better for you. In Jeremiah 31, 3, it says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. This type of drawing might be better understood as a compelling, a compelling by love. God says it's his faithful, never failing, bound love that draws us to him. And that's what Jesus is saying the Father uses to draw all men to himself. The drawing of God leads to the knowing of God. It's his faithful love that should compel us to obedience and return us back to right relationship, back to the intimacy that he invites us into. And believe it, this should be true of us. We should be able to trace back our history and time and life from the moment we said yes to see man over and over again. I'm remembering God's faithfulness his kindness to me, his goodness, his sacrifice to me, a love that brings me back to him in embrace, not fear. Perfect love casts out fear, so then his drawing is a drawing of love, saying, wow, that God again is drawing me back to him to believe again, to trust again, back to knowing him. It's a love that compels us to come to the king who invites us. But also, like, if you're an eager and you're like, oh, man, I don't really know, I don't really believe, that. I don't consider myself a Christian or um, I don't really know this experience you're maybe talking about. That's okay. Something I would tell you, whether you believe or not, is that God is also drawing you. And sometimes this drawing can just feel like a felt need. Like you feel and you realize that you have a need for a Savior. That you need it that you're not enough to carry the weight of your sin and brokenness, and that you can't be your own healer. Because if you're honest, if you could be your own healer, you would have healed yourself by now. But you are unable. So if you can hear him, that quiet knock to taste and see over and over again, don't ignore the Spirit of God has life for you. Like Moses challenges the children of Israel, after that second covenant, before on his deathbed, he says, choose life. Just choose it. They didn't. But it's the invitation of the same. Just, just choose life. If God is drawing you, he's inviting you to know him. And knowing God is like, of course, nothing less than knowing the law, knowing um, you know, the law that's completed in the teachings of Jesus and the apostles. Um, but remember, the new covenant isn't just an active so we can learn more stuff. Um, it's to know a person. So yes, we get to um, eat and drink in the Word. Like, that is nothing about Sometimes you go to like church services and they're like, you gotta know the Lord. And they give you like 12 lists of things to do to know Him. It's like, you gotta, I don't know, read your Word every single day at 5 a.m. and then pray at 6 and then, you know, all this stuff. Like, and we're, I love, great. Devotional lives, fantastic. Not against it. But you're knowing a person, not a workout routine. Okay? So, yes, eat the word, drink deep in the well, but you've got to be with him to know him. We go from knowing about God because he indwells in us. Hebrews 8.10 says, I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they, should be, they shall be my people. The new covenant does something the old one cannot. It transforms us from the inside out. So I'm going to go for a couple, just a couple minutes, just like really specifically for the Bible nerds, just a little bit, okay? And then we're going to come back, we're going to come back out, <laughs> and then we're going to wrap it up, okay? All right. The covenant does something, the new covenant is something the old covenant couldn't. So basically, we don't need priests, prophets, and kings to tell us about God, because we have the ultimate priest, prophet, and king dwelling in us. 
So here we go. I think the ESV does a really good job of conveying the ideas in this Jeremiah text. It says, I will put my laws within them. The phrase within them translates a word called kareb, meaning the inward part of a man, a seat and thought and emotion of a person. That's why other translations take that idea and translate it into heart. Like if that's not a wrong translation, that's good. Like the heart of a person, the center of a person. The center of a person's thoughts and emotions, their place of motivation. It's good. So we're going to hold on to that idea. Within them is the center of a person, correct. But then the text says God will put his law in the inward parts. That idea of law translates to Torah. And Torah, like, you know, like, yeah, okay, that seems like a simple translation. But there's this idea when you go and look at word definitions that sometimes they're used in different ways, even though it's the same word. The way Torah is used, like, it's nothing less than God's law, like his good and right prescribed way for living, relating to the world, relating to each other, and relating to him. It's nothing less than that. But in this moment, this particular placing, the word alludes to God's instruction in the messianic age. We are not going there today. But his instruction in the messianic age, meaning simply, this is an age when the Messiah, Jesus, reigns as king and lord, and the world is put right, renewed, and restored. So we put these two ideas together, putting God's law within us, in our hearts. We can say that the renewer and his renewed way of living will be put inside you at the very center of your person, at your thought, at your emotion. But what is it doing? It's sitting, a seated, ruling, or we just say, we will be transformed because the Messiah will sit in our hearts. That is the pathway to transformation. Christ sitting and ruling in our hearts. And that's good news because it's something that children of Israel didn't have. They didn't have changed hearts from the inside. The story of the new covenant is simple. The people couldn't keep the covenant, so God changed the people. He comes after us. He doesn't abandon us. He transforms us. He saves us. He does the work, and then he invites us. Verse 11 says, they will all know me from the least to the greatest. They were all invited to know him. We can all be transformed because they were cleansed and forgiven, so much so that at the very end of the passage it says, they will remember their sins no more all invited to receive the new covenant by faith. The covenant bound intimate relationship with God. But note, the bound intimate relationship requires giving up autonomy. There is no intimacy without giving up autonomy. For the Messiah to rule from the seat of your heart, for him to be the ruler seated, it means you have to get out. If it's a chair, someone has to move for someone else to sit down. Saying to the Lord, your will for mine, your desires for mine. There's only one seat, one chair, and our hearts literally cannot sustain two. Because it was crafted for one, one ruler of the kings. In a simple way, or a light way, it's like you wanting to be a fan of a championship winning football team, but you love the Panthers. <laughs> also, I've never met a grown black man under the age of 40 or like 40 and up who's not a die-hard like Cowboys fan. And the, like I think it's super hard to be a Cowboys fan. Like just, just note that. Just note that you're like, next time you meet like an old black man, you're like, are you a Cowboys fan? And then you look at you a little strange and you're like, yeah, I'm a Cowboys fan. And you're like, that's tough, that's tough, that's tough, that's tough. <laughs> or maybe <laughs> your heart can't sustain too and you're a bit like Usher, the singer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the lyrics to a song called, What's a Man to Do? Seated. <laughs> 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 My heart is 
is in two different places. Oh. <laughs> I got you in my life. And I want to do, right? But it's hard to let go. <laughs> when my love has two different faces, faces, and I can't break ties because they both look right, someone tell me what's a man to do when he's loving too. Oh. And he don't want to lie. But he can't tell the truth? <laughs> trash. Hot. Trash. <laughs> and you know what song came after that? Confessions. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to love to you, you'll be confessing very soon. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Usher. Anyway, yeah, your heart can't sustain two. It's meant, it's meant for one. And it's meant for the king. It's really just meant for Jesus. It's his seat. He made it. It fits him. In like a very weird way, I don't know why I'm doing this. Anyway, like if you have a pair of shoes, like, and they have like the, the soft memory foam, they only mold to your feet. You know? Like it's just made for you. It's just made for the king. Your heart, it can't do anything more. He wants to transform it. Why pretend it can do anything else when it can't? If you're as tired as I think you are, Come to the come to the king. He relieves burdens. Like there's a part of this that's beautiful and amazing, and a part that's also like real practical. Like if you're tired, come to the one who calls the weary and the tired. We must surrender, y'all. Surrender to love, keeping that in mind. That it's not just about these big, awesome moments that we think we can just declare. You know, I I choose Jesus. It's like it's amazing. I love that for us. I love youth camp when you were 14 declaring your love for Jesus and forever and ever you're going to follow him. I love those moments of declaration. Yet it's the surrender in the everyday moments, the everyday yeses, leaning into the spirit, saying yes, so you can have a lifetime of obedience. It's an everyday yes that turns into weeks of yeses, that turns into months of yeses, that turns into years of yeses, and then we see a lifetime of faithfulness. And sometimes we have to say yes, like, a couple times in the same day, and that's okay. That is a life surrender. It is turning and returning because you know there's a loving Father calling you and drawing you back to Him. So we have to get out the seat. We've got to let God rule in our hearts in order to get to know Him. That's the deal. Someone else has got to sit there. So this is great information. We see that Jesus completes the covenant and he's the minister of a new covenant. That's definitely like the old one that gives us transformed hearts and minds because he comes internally. But what does it actually look like to get to know him? Like how can we, you know, we love it in the West, an application point. Uh, how do we apply this to our lives? Um, I, you know, Jesus is a person <laughs> who's alive. Um, it's much like getting to know a person, a friend or a coworker. We spend time with him. Like, we spend time with him. Jesus himself spent three years with the disciples in intimate, everyday, regular life. Fishing, eating, sleeping, drinking, meeting family. He spent time. There was no area of life that was off limits to him. And he spent it, he spent his time with the disciples in an everyday, regular way. Some ideas on what that could look like if you're like, I want my bullet points. Here we go. Spend time in his word to learn what he's like. Um, it's really simple. Like, it's God talking to us. You need to hear his heart and what he wrote. Spend time talking to him in prayer. That's what prayer is. Talking to God. Talk to him. Spend time listening to what he has to say. And to know the way that he speaks, he speaks in his word. What does that say about something? It's in his word. Yeah. But also, the spirit is real. The spirit will speak to you. He has plenty to say about your life. You can't listen. Be quiet. We believe that the spirit is alive and moving and speaking. And also, listen to what he says in his people. Like, those are the ways that God has invited us into to hearing him, his word, his spirit, and his people. Um, and then we meet him. I think this is the coolest part, that there's an embodiment. We exactly announce that there's like a way that Jesus 
changes our whole everything. <laughs> we meet him in what he invites us to do. Like he says, do this thing. And when we obey it, we actually learn what he's like by doing those activities. Like we learn what he's like, we learn what he cares about, we learn what he prioritizes, we learn what he does not think is important, and we learn what he does think is important. And in those actions, we're actually changed because we're becoming like him. And that can be like generosity. Like, what does Jesus say about generosity? Who we're giving our time, our talent, possessions. What happens when you've learned to say no to something else, to say yes, to be generous, to give, and now something in your heart and mind is changing. Like, oh, these, these possessions aren't the priority in life. And then we know that, oh, my dad like, doesn't care, like, care about these possessions the same way. He prioritizes the people over the stuff. And I, you're becoming a person who prioritizes people over stuff. And that is contradictory to how the culture prioritizes stuff over people. Jesus is changing us. And then we witness, we went, we're a witness in the world by how we're changed to what God is like to the world we live as people with different priorities. Our hospitality, preparing a place for other people. We take the time to honor another human before us and say, come. Come eat, come sit, come talk. I want to spend time with you. I'm not busy, my phone, down. Doesn't even matter, what phone, you know? I see you, you are worth, you are worth being seen. You are worth your dreams being heard. I don't care how crazy you are, you're worth my time. What does that say about our father? What does he prioritize in people? What does he care about? Same thing with serving others or sharing his good news of the kingdom, that he would not just us, to get the benefit of the kingdom, but he wants others, as many others as possible, to share in that same kingdom reality and then to become people who reproduce it. That's what a disciple is, receiver of the kingdom and then living the kingdom out. That, that's the whole, the whole thing. We become changed, but then we know him. We know something about him through following him, obeying him, and meeting him in what he prescribes for us. When we live for another kingdom, we meet the king, and we get to know him. So, I mean, I would encourage everyone here to uh, read John 15. That's right, homework at church. Um, I would tell Corey, but it's nice to ask people if they did their homework. <laughs> read John 15 and see what Jesus' invitation to dwell with him is, and what he has for us through him making us his home. Like, what does he actually desire to change and do and transform and live that out? So church, simply put, we are invited to dwell with the one who dwells in us because he loves us. And maybe you've got to believe that, so my encouragement to you is really simple. Like, open the door to the one who's knocking. Just open the door. In Hebrews uh, 3, earlier in the book, um, it says, today, if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Like, don't, don't respond in a way that would, would push him away when you don't need him. If you hear the Spirit knocking, God is drawing himself to you. If the person and work of Jesus is becoming more clear and more beautiful, like, let him in. Trust him. Believe that he is who he is, that he really is your only healer. And man, we would love to talk to you about it. If that's you, you're like, yo, today's the day. Any one of these prayer people down here, leading people, will be, we'd love to talk to you about it. So that's really what I have for us today. Um, that <laughs> Jesus is enough for all of us. He's enough for all of us. He dwells within us. He longs to transform us. And that Jesus really is the author of a, a covenant that is, is worth giving up everything for. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your kindness and your goodness to us. God, I pray that we would receive the invitation of your dwelling. We would receive the reality of your spirit making room, changing us from the inside out because you washed us, that you gave your son for us and everything that should have been due to us was put on him that we might become your children and you would forgive us and remember our sins no more 
and then make a hold of us, God. What an amazing reality that the one who is worthy of everything would come down and make himself known to us. And then want to make himself known to the world through us. God, this truly is a crazy, amazing story we get to be a part of as believers. God, I pray that it would just sink deeper and deeper, that we would know you more and more, that we would yield every day in the big moments and in every single little one so you could sit on the throne of our hearts and we would be transformed more and more into the person of Christ. Father, we can't do this because we didn't want it. We do it because you're powerful enough to do it. We're dependent upon your spirit. So God, move in us, blow on us afresh, move in us a fresh way that our testimony to God met us to change me. And we would be people who change in the world because the one who is beautiful has come and sat down with us. Father, we thank you and we praise you. Draw all hearts of men to you. Amen.